Today we're reading Matthew 5, 1 to 12. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed the hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then you can embrace by the one more, most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that cannot be bought. You're blessed when you worked up a good appetite for God, his food and drink in the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak sly about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close to comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens, give a cheer even, for thought they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in a good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Who here has had the joy of assembling a piece of furniture from Ikea? <laughs> I have to confess, unlike many people, I actually love putting Ikea furniture together. There's something oddly satisfying about following those step-by-step -step instructions, even with all the little pieces and those picture diagrams. Pretty amazing experience, isn't it? I know sometimes it can be a frustrating experience, but in reality, I'm genuinely amazed at how well the process works. You start with a flat packed box, follow the instructions to assemble it, and voila, you end up with a desk or a kitchen island, a dresser or a bed. Nearly all the time, all the necessary screws and bolts and pieces are included in the box. And if by chance something is missing, IKEA has replacement parts readily available. So one thing I've learned, though, is the key to success is following the instructions carefully. Those millions of little pieces and step-by-step -step guides. If I skip steps or jump ahead, I'll end up with a mess. If I just start putting pieces together without following the instructions sheet, which I have been known to do, and particularly by following the instruction sheet in order, I won't be successful in putting it together properly. If I start on step 14 and then try to go back later to step one, I'll have a jumbled mess on my hands. At best, it won't function properly. At worst, it won't come together at all. And I'll be left with something that doesn't work as it was designed to. Sometimes life feels like that, doesn't it? We try our best to pull things together but sometimes we just don't. It has been found difficult and left untried. I think maybe the microphone. Okay, well, I'll try that again. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. In today's scripture reading from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives us what has been called the Sermon on the Mount. The greatest lesson ever taught by the greatest teacher of all time. The sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, outlines the core principles of our Christian faith. It comprises a little over 10% of the entire Gospel of Matthew. It begins with the Beatitudes, 
You know, the sayings that start with, blessed are. We heard a little different version this morning, which might have perked up our ears. These are promises of the blessings that are ours when certain qualities of being are present in our lives. One of the first contemplations on the Beatitudes came from St. Gregory of Nyssa, a mystic who lived in Cappadocia, which was central Turkey around 380 AD. He described the Beatitudes this way. Beatitude is a possession of all things held to be good, from which nothing is absent that a good desire may want. Perhaps the meaning of beatitude may become clearer to us if it is compared with its opposite. Now, the opposite of beatitude is misery. Misery means being afflicted unwillingly with painful sufferings. Does that sound like what we call anxiety today? Most everyone, even non-Christians, know about the Ten Commandments, most of which lay out the things we should not do. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no idols. Number three, you shall take the name of the Lord. You shall not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. Number four, keep the Sabbath day holy. Number five, honor your mother and father. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear fault witness against your neighbor. And number 10, you shall not covet. Isn't that how we learn, especially in the early years? Watching my daughters with their little ones, I see this pattern repeated. Most of the lessons their toddlers are learning probably feel like a long list of thou shalt nots. Thou shalt not hit. Thou shalt not cross the street without holding my hand. Thou shalt not pull the dog's hair. These rules help set boundaries, keeping their children safe while they learn about the world. These commandments are essential for building a moral foundation, setting us on the right path, to lay the foundation for a more complex understanding as we grow. And then Jesus comes along and takes it to a whole new level. In the Beatitudes, Jesus doesn't replace the law. He fulfills it. He brings it to its fullest by moving beyond the don'ts and inviting us into a higher level of consciousness, a way of being that transcends simple rule-following. Instead of just avoiding wrongdoings, Jesus calls us to embrace qualities like mercy, humility, and peacemaking. He shifts the focus from external actions to the conditions of the heart. And I watch parenting happen this way as well. We love our friends. Your body needs rest. We have gentle hands with Charlie the dog. The Beatitudes show us what it means to live fully in the kingdom of God, not just by following the letter of the law, but by embodying the spirit of love, grace, and compassion that the law was always meant to inspire. Where the Ten Commandments set the stage for right living, the Beatitudes call us to a deeper, more conscious way of being, fulfilling the law through a life transformed in Christ. Once again, Jesus elevates the law, not by discarding it, but by deepening its meaning and transforming our approach to it. The Sermon on the Mount has been referred to as the most important and most controversial biblical text and the greatest moral document of all time. Hmm. When we compare the Ten Commandments with the Beatitudes, there's the obvious difference between the things not to do and the positive promises of blessings that are ours in the Beatitudes. And there are some other important things I'd love for us to consider. Before we go, there are a few comments. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the season we're in moving into fall and about the season of the church calendar. In the church, we are in ordinary time. We have our green little things up here, which is the longest season in the church calendar, comprising over half of the entire year. And my dear friends, this is a great reminder of the way that life works. In all of life, there are milestone events, major celebrations, photo album moments, 
And then there is cooking dinner, cleaning the house, doing the laundry, changing diapers, driving carpool, going to work every day, you know, the ordinary days. More often than not, it's in these ordinary times that build a life of meaning and purpose and joy. The same is true in our lives as part of the church community within our faith family. It's in the ordinary times that learning and growth and deepening relationships happen. Those who've come before us knew this and lived it out. For a long time, interestingly, all Christians called each other saints. They were all saints regardless of how well or how badly they lived or how experienced or inexperienced they were. They referred to each other as saints, not because of perfection, but because of the life they were chosen to lead, a life of faith in the midst of everyday struggles. My hope for us today and in the week ahead is to first think about and pray about these ordinary moments, but don't stop there. The next step is to take some action. Do something specific to bring the promises and blessings of the Beatitudes to life. Life is not lived in theory, and if we stay in our heads alone with no change in our day-to-day actions, then we're like people who want to win the lottery but won't buy a ticket. There's another distinction about the Beatitudes that might be challenging to get our heads wrapped around, but let's see if we can think about it. Think about this and see where the Spirit might lead us. The Ten Commandments are stated mostly in the negative, And it's a list of things we are not supposed to do, right? So the Beatitudes are stated in the positive, but they are a list of the things we are supposed to do? I don't think so. The Beatitudes are actually bigger than behavior. They're more than a checklist of things to do. They're what we might call a package deal. All of them go together. It makes no sense, and maybe more accurately, it is not possible to talk about being pure in heart if we are not already poor in spirit. How are we supposed to be merciful if we are not already peacemakers? The issue that might confound us is how do we do these things? And the answer is, we don't. Remember what Jesus said? I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me, and I in them, bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. John 5, 15. The Beatitudes are what we become. They represent the transformation that happens within us in union with Christ. They are the promise of God's grace available to everyone, not just the best and brightest among us. It is a gift and it cannot be earned. And yet that doesn't mean that we do nothing. It does require something of us. Is that confusing? Sometimes it is to me. If I can't earn God's grace, if it's unmerited, which means I don't deserve it, if it is a gift, then why do I need to do anything? This might fall short or break down on deep reflection, but the best analogy I can think of is how a radio works. Does anyone still listen to the radio? Did you know that there are 101 FM frequencies that carry a broadcast signal? In our area, if you want to listen to classical music, you need to tune your radio to 91.5. If you want jazz, go to 88.1. If you want K-Rock, it's 106.7. If you don't want to listen to anything, turn your radio off. How do we tune to God's frequency? Well, we start by wanting to. We turn our tuner, our receiver, on. And then we seek the signal that God is broadcasting. I know this sounds very simplistic, but God is broadcasting in a lot of ways. Prayer, scripture study, worship, conversations with others, coincidences, paying attention to our dreams, music, even movies. All of these are ways to tune in to God's frequencies. And over time, this connection to God changes us. For most of us, the changes will come little by little over time in what will probably be ordinary time. It'll come in those seemingly mundane moments 
until at some point when we find ourselves in a situation, like when we're with a person who normally bugs us to no end, we find ourselves peaceful and calm. Maybe we could say we find ourselves pure in heart or merciful. And then we come across a person in our work or neighborhood or social network that has been unfairly maligned, and we find ourselves mourning their pain or wanting righteousness. We did not manufacture these qualities. They become part of us as we get honest about our state of being and lean into God. They become part of us as we stay connected to the vine and remember that we are the branches. In this church, we are starting our covenant process for 2025. Covenant packages are going out this coming week. For everyone who's already a member, you most likely know a bit about the process. For anyone who's not already a member, the process of turning in a covenant is the only basis for membership. So what is a covenant? The short answer is, it's an agreement, a promise, a commitment. As it pertains to community church, a covenant is a statement that says you wish to be a member of this church. It might include other commitments like joining a Bible study to deepen your faith and relationships, to serve in an area where you feel called to serve, perhaps on a board or committee. It might include a commitment to provide financial support in the form of a regular offering. There's a lot more to talk about when it comes to what goes into a membership covenant in the church, and there'll be an opportunity for everyone to learn more about this process and enter into the profound process of covenanting and membership. So what does our church membership covenant have to do with the Beatitudes? Well, everything. The Beatitudes are God's covenant promise to us as revealed by Jesus. The blessings described in the Beatitudes that are available to us is an agreement, a promise, a commitment. They also give us a framework for thinking about our covenants with God. In this case, our covenants is part of a faith family, a community of gathered people, a church. The first two Beatitudes reflect our absolute need for God in our lives, recognition that we are poor in spirit, and recognition of how we mourn. The third and fourth Beatitudes reflect our recognition that we are given gifts and strengths from God. Our meekness, which is not our weakness, is about giving back to God what we've been given so that God can direct us in how we use our gifts and talents and strengths. And we recognize our hunger and thirst for righteousness, wanting and working for justice, not in some far-off distant time and place, but here and now, in the world in which we live. And then in the last four Beatitudes, we join God in his mission that is already at work in the world. We recognize the ways we can be merciful, pure in heart, to be peacemakers, and to be okay with being persecuted for righteousness' sake. Do you see the progression here? We move from powerlessness, turning life and will over to the care of God, to who we have been created to be, to joining in God's mission in the world. The progression is the key to how we shape and form our own covenants with God, our agreements, our promises, our commitments. Sometimes in our church life, we hear people refer to themselves as volunteers. While volunteering is important, especially in many areas of life, it may not fully capture what it means to serve in a church setting, particularly in a congregational church. In the church, we aren't just volunteering. We are called to serve. And there's a significant difference between being called and simply volunteering. When we serve out of a sense of calling, we find a deeper purpose and resilience even when times get tough. Volunteers may experience burnout, not necessarily from working too hard, but from feeling ineffective or disconnected from their purpose. But when we're following God's call for us, we are sustained by a greater sense of meaning and fulfillment, which helps us persevere through the challenges. When the challenges arise, those who are called continue to serve, not because it's always easy or because it was their own plan, 
but because they are responding to what God is asking of them. They find strength in knowing they're part of something greater than themselves. And trust me, when you're working to further God's kingdom, difficulties will come. It's part of the journey. But when you're rooted in your calling, you find the perseverance to push through, knowing that you're fulfilling a purpose far beyond your own ideas. We start by getting our hearts aligned on the inside, long before we make any commitments to do anything. First things first. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, 33. Years ago, when I was new in my membership in this church, I kept asking our pastor, what should I be doing to help? And the pastor said, just keep showing up, stay steady in your disciple band group, and what you are called to do will appear. Wise counsel indeed. One of the most dangerous things in our spiritual lives is to go off half-cocked, to start taking action before it is time before our insides start being aligned with God's will and purpose, aligned with how we can be useful to God's kingdom work, which is already happening. Jesus never cared very much about the ways we fall short when we failed. He cares about and said over and over in many ways, where is your heart? Our inside matters far more than our outside, at least for Jesus which is a far cry from the ways of the world. I said my goal for us this coming week was to think about the promises Jesus has made in the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes and to start to marry theory with practical action. If you want to take time to do some very simple things this week, every day, consistently for seven days, I think you'll be surprised at what might be revealed. So I'm inviting you to spend at least 10 minutes a day for the next seven days, reading Matthew 5, 1 to 12, every day, and spending some time in prayer, asking God to reveal to you what this might mean for you. And take some notes. I'm asking you to invest a little bit of time over the next seven days. Ten minutes a day, 70 minutes total, just over one hour of approximately 112 waking hours that you'll have this week. Whatever else you do this coming week, I believe if you do this, it will have a profound effect on your life. Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. From our G.K. Chesterton. Don't let that be something that can be said about you. Try it and see what God has in store for you. Did you know that the Greek word translated as blessing is markarios? It is also something translated as happy, and that can be translated also as risen from the dead. Risen from the dead are the poor in spirit. Risen from the dead are those who mourn. Risen from the dead are the meek. Risen from the dead are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Risen from the dead are the merciful. Risen from the dead are the pure in heart. Risen from the dead are the peacemakers. Risen from the dead are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Turn on your tuner. Get on God's frequency every day and take the steps to go on the journey that leads to life. The journey of promise and blessing. That Jesus revealed. This isn't a one-time event, it's a lifelong journey that gets deeper and more profound as we become a people who reflect the ideals that Jesus revealed. Amen.